Let us come together in faith, knowing that though the world may rock, our hope in Christ is unwavering and secure. And this is In The Moment. I'm your host, Reverend Ricky Allen Jr., thanking you as always for joining us on this lovely day the Lord has made and wherever you are. Whatever you're doing, as always, we pray that the Lord Jesus Christ is out front. And I would like to take a moment to thank everybody for the birthday wishes last weekend as I entered the big number 47. Yes, 47 years old and God is good all the time and all the time God is good. Thank you for your love, for the cards, for the gifts. Truly felt very spoiled, had a fantastic time with my church family and it was just a blessing. It really, really was. And I just pray that 47 is better than ever. So with that being said, let's get to work. Our morning scripture comes from Romans 8, 35 through 37. Romans 8, 35 through 37 reads, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen. And maybe you're one of those out there that needs to understand that nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. We're going to pray for your encouragement right now because you might be dealing with opposition, dealing with people that are trying to tear you down. But that's okay because God's got you. So, of course, go to our website if you need a specific prayer request, get-prayer.com. Get-prayer.com. It is there for you to submit your prayer requests so that we may share them with the world. And we would love for everybody to pray with you and for you as well. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today as your children seeking your strength and your guidance. We live in a world that often mocks our faith in Jesus Christ. And at times we may feel the weight of doubt or discouragement when others ridicule what we hold dear. Yet we are reminded that no trial, no mockery, no persecution can ever separate us from your love. You are our constant source of hope. And through you, we are more than conquerors. Lord Jesus, help us to stand firm in our faith, even when the voices around us seek to tear us down. Let us be rooted in your word, drawing confidence from your promises. When the world questions or scorns, let our response be one of love, grace, and trust in you, never shaken. Empower us, Lord, through the Holy Spirit to remain in your word, remembering that our identity is not shaped by the opinions of others, no, but by the truth of you and who you are and what you've done for us. We ask, Lord, that you fill our hearts with the boldness that we might speak your truth, not my truth, your truth, with the compassion and the courage needed. Give us the humility to pray for those who mock us, knowing that your grace is available to all. Help us to remember that the trials we face now are momentary and that they pale in comparison to the glory that awaits us in Christ. Lord, when we are tempted to grow weary, remind us that our battles, and it's not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of darkness. Please equip us with the armor of God so that we may stand firm in the day of trial. Surround us with your peace, knowing that you have already won the ultimate victory through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Finally, Father, we ask you, we thank you for the assurance that no matter what we face, your love remains unshakable. May we live each day in the fullness of that love trusting in your mercy and standing firm in your truth. Give us strength, Lord. Please encourage us and guide us as we walk boldly in this world that has lost its way. Guide us in showing them the way, the 
truth in the light of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our King. In his powerful and most precious name we pray. Amen. Today our topic is when the world mocks, we build. When the world mocks us, we just keep building. When they mock your job, you keep building a career. When they mock your wife or your husband, you keep building that marriage. When they mock your family, you keep building up those sons and daughters. When they mock your life, you keep building up the legacy that God through Jesus Christ has given you. And as a steward of his blessings, you keep building it up. And our text comes today from Jude 17 through 21. Go to Jude. I'm sure you got to maybe knock the dust off of that area of the Bible. But nonetheless, though, probably not because you're you're astute to the word. You read you read and study all the books of the Bible. Do you not? Of course you do. Jude 17 through 21 reads as follows. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reading of your already blessed word. Now, Lord, help us really dive into your word now. I don't know who's listening right now. I don't know who's watching right now, but I do know they're standing by ready not to react to the world, but respond to the world with your word. So help us learn something and apply it to our lives today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. When the world mocks, we build. God has made everybody here a, a builder. We build homes, we build neighborhoods, we are building things according to his plans that reflect the kingdom of God here on earth. And we do this spiritually. And because of this, Satan's goal is to do whatever is needed to disrupt construction. God built the system known as marriage. We build on that system by getting married. <laughs> Satan works to destroy marriages or better yet, redefine them. God built the system for families. We follow that system in building up our families. Satan works to destroy that as well. God created the church. We follow the instructions in God's word on what the church is and isn't in its mission to glorify God and to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Satan works to disrupt that as well with false teachers and false preachers. To make it more relatable, to you, to me, we notice two ways he does this. Through willing human participants who are against God and through distractions. The dictionary defines distractions as a thing that prevents someone from giving full attention to something else. And when Christians are distracted, they are prevented in giving full attention to God through Jesus Christ. And the reason that happens is because Satan has realized that he doesn't have to shut a church down. All he has to do is just distract you. And as a result, many are willing and unknowingly are being led away from God's word. And if that doesn't work, Satan goes on to another form of distraction, mocking. That is what we're seeing today. If he can't stop you, he'll try to slow you down by doing things that, and saying things that tug at your heart so that you're more focused on responding to him rather than God's word. 
And when you're speaking to someone about God in the store or in the street, and then there's a person or people that come up and throw question after question at you that get you all worked up, and then you turn you turn to the distraction from the one who desires Christ, and you take the next 30 minutes to defend your faith against the one who doesn't care, the only thing they worry about is distracting you from that person that desires Christ. That's all they want to do. When you post something on Facebook and that one person decides that they're going to speak on behalf of all the non-believers everywhere and reply to your post with something snarky and, and they get you writing like 18 paragraphs, someone knows what I'm talking about out there, you, you have not only been triggered, but you've been distracted. They want to show everyone that while you think you're doing something biblical, helpful, impactful, their whole job is to distract people from what you had originally post. So here's what you do with people like that. Hide their comments and keep it moving. That's all you got to do. In God's word, Nehemiah dealt with this as well. If you go to chapter four, when they were rebuilding the wall, we read the following. When Sambalot heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. And in the and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are these, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore the wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonites, who was at his side, said, What they are building, even a fox climbing up on it, would break down their walls of stones. But look at what look at look at what Nehemiah says here. Look at what he did, because this is told Nehemiah is told in first person. So he goes from telling the story to what he did. It's a very good transition. Listen to this in verse 4, chapter 4. Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in the land in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. Because when they mock, we build. When they mock us for doing what God has called us to do, we build. We don't stop. We don't get distracted. We don't get worked up. You just keep building what God called you to do. We build because the focused Christian stays on task with the Lord. We build because Satan is destroying everything around us and fooling the masses thinking that life without anything constructed by God is better. We build because we know the foundation is God's word. And when we build on that foundation, we are stable and we will not be so easily blown over and broken, shattered to pieces. And because we have this drive, this faith, this hope, Satan will keep sending distractions. But you stay on the job for the Lord. You stand tall, keep your faith, and hold your head up. Maintain composure. This is where Jude, brother James, is in his thinking. He writes to fellow believers about how some ungodly people have slipped in among them. He goes on for about 16 verses talking about these ungodly people and their agendas and how they're judged. And then he gets to verse 17 where we see him shift from a well-informed warning to a place of, Here's what you do about this, this, this type of talk, because it's one thing to present problems. It's a whole other thing to present solutions. We got a lot of people in churches today that can point out problems and have a thousand ideas, but they have no solutions and lack the plans of how to execute their ideas. If God showed you a problem, he also told you how to solve it. You may not like it, you may not accept it, but you did get the information though. If God sent you the idea, he also sent you the plan for how to execute the idea. 
And Jude presents ways to respond to these problematic ungodly people. In a nutshell, when they mock, we build. But what are we building though? And why are we building? When the world mocks, we build because memory strengthens faith. Memory strengthens faith. Look at verse 17 and 18. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. The power of memory is important in our Christian walk. It ur Jude urges believers to recall the teachings and warnings of the apostles, especially regarding the presence of scoffers in the last days. Mockers and skeptics are not a surprise to God. Their behavior has already been talked about throughout the Bible. Prophesied even most. Remember, this helps us to view their acts as part of God's plan either way. He's already laid an ark for them. We know how that ends. And that should strengthen our faith rather than cause us to doubt. This is why. Remembering what God has done for you in the past helps you in the present and gives you faith in the present and for the future. When you can look back at what the Lord has done for you, where he brought you from, the, how he changed you from your wretched life that you used to live, be blessed that you can say used to live. There are some people that can't use that type of terminology because they're still living it. Be blessed by that. So we don't react, we respond to the word of God in our hearts, we remember God's word. We remember his promises. Psalm 1911 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Second Timothy 2.15, do your best to present your God, yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. How do we handle the word of truth? The only way to handle God's word correctly is through studying God's word. And when we study God's word, you are able to retain and apply God's word. And when you retain and apply God's word, you are able to remember God's word in a way that's relatable and you can present God's word to the world around you. Now, in this case, Jude is telling the people they need to remember what the apostles Apostle said about scoffers in the last days. Now you're reading that word scoffer in your Bible, depending on what version you have, and are wondering where the word mocker is at that I keep using. In the Greek, scoffer is used interchangeably. It, it, the word scoffer in Hatikas is a definition is a mocker by implication a false teacher. And how it is used is a mocker scoffer. We're going to try that, that Greek one more time. Emphatictus. <laughs> it takes practice, people. It really takes practice even for me. So you'll see in some Bibles, mocker, and in others, scoffer. So hopefully that clears up any questions you may have there. And when it comes to citing what the apostle said, well, he doesn't give in an apostle's name, we can go to where their words speak of these scoffers, these mockers, these ungodly people. Where, where do we find this in God's word? Talk to 2 Peter 3, 3 with me. 2 Peter 3, 3. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, here it is, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. Friends, we have, a, we have the blessing by God through Christ and knowing that these people are out there and they're going to do what they have chosen to do against God. I want to make it very clear here. This is willful ignorance. Willful ignorance. If they wanted to know about God, there's a church in the United States on every corner. You can go find a church. Google a church. You can go find one. Just Google one. 
It's no, they, they are without excuse. In 2024, you are without excuse. You can go on the internet and find God's word. You can find free commentaries. You can find people you can actually email and ask questions about God's word, and they will email you back and let you know exactly what's going on in God's word. But they choose not to. They choose that. The problem is we got to present this hope that we have in Jesus, not as an opposing view, but as the good news. The problem we're having is that we have more people willing to debate than relate. Are you someone that likes to argue? Are you someone that spends most of your time getting great pleasure out of debating? And do you find yourself by yourself in the end with nothing to show for what you've done? I would suggest right now that you repent, friend, because you're not winning no points with God. God desires us to go out and share the good news of Christ. Defending the faith, yes. Not sell the faith. And before you cite 1 Peter 3.15, remember what it says. Take a, take a, just take a moment and keep in mind what it says. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Here it is. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. That is your testimony. Why do you believe what you believe? He didn't say question and answer. He said give a testimony. Be able to give the reason to why you believe what you believe because if you go back and forth tit for tat with people they could they have gone on the internet they have pre prepared to approach you guarantee that if they are approaching you with any questions or any of you about their non-belief they're asking it because they are prepared to set you up and knock you down to the best of their ability it's like when you see someone that comes up to you all rough and tough why are they approaching you why, why have they decided that they have all this confidence to engage you? You better be careful. More, there's a reason as to why that confidence is there. There's a source of their confidence, and most of the time, it's a weapon. <laughs> That's why they're coming at you so confidently, without any doubts or measure. There's something they have inside of them or on them that is giving them that confidence to approach you. The same thing with non-believers. They are approaching you because they've already crafted a line of messaging that they're going to do with you back and forth. This is not at random. This is not something that comes off the dome. This is rehearsed. This is very rehearsed. That's why they can approach you without even knowing who you are. They've already got a script in place to question you, and then when you give the obvious answers, they have more questions because they have prepped for the obvious answers. Non-believers should be public affairs specialists because of the fact they have their talking points already in place on what they believe and why they believe it, and they're ready for you when you bring Captain Obvious to them. Look at what the scripture says. Be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. That is your testimony. It cannot be found on the internet. It cannot be found anywhere but inside you where it lives with the Holy Spirit in you. But look at what it says here on the end of that verse, but do this with gentleness and respect. Do it with gentleness and respect. You hold the, to the grace of the Father. Don't act like them because you look like them. And when we're called to be set apart, in any case, a passerby that sees you speaking to a non-believer about God's word should be able to tell who the believer is and the one that is not. In the Bible, scoffers are depicted as those who mock God's ways and pursue ungodly desires. Proverbs 19.29 states that penalties are prepared for mockers indicating that their actions are seen as rebellious and deserving of the judgment. Psalm 1 once uh, warns also against associating with mockers, suggesting that they represent a path leading to destruction. The act of mocking is also addressed. We, we note the famous verse, Galatians 6, 7, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. 
So God's view of these scoffers is clear. They mock now, but they are ultimately held accountable. When we remember this, our faith is strengthened, knowing that we are part of a story where God's justice and truth will prevail. And by holding on to the teachings of Christ, to application by the apostles, we can build a foundation that withstands the scorn of the world. And when the world mocks, we build because unity overcomes division. Unity overcomes division. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. We read that in Jude 19. Those who mock and cause divisions are driven by worldly desires, not the spirit of God. And they thrive on causing separation within the faith community. But unity is our defense against division. By standing together in the faith, believers can create the barrier of protection against the forces of mockery and the skeptics, making it resistant to the attacks that seek to fracture the integrity of the church. They will call you hypocrites. They will say God's word is hate speech. They will say you're not loving and accepting all because we support God's standard and the lifestyles of, of, of all. And when you see churches bending the knee to worldly rules on gender, birth, lifestyles of all sorts, lawlessness, when you do not hear them call for repentance, only acceptance, your next question should be, where is the exit? Because there's, there's nothing more than spiritual entertainers here who are scared to tell the truth and expose the evils of this world. They have given in to these people whose only mission is to divide and destroy the church of God. These people are known as devoid of the spirit. When the world mocks, we build because faith is the fortress. Uh, verse 20, but you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, when the world mocks, we build because Jude encourages believers to strengthen themselves by continually building their faith. The process requires dedication and intentional growth. Where faith becomes more than belief, it transforms into this secure, holy foundation. Just as a fortress protects from the external threats, a well-built faith can withstand the mockery and opposition of the world. And of course, important to this process is praying in the Holy Spirit. Let me be very clear. I am not talking about tongues here. This kind of prayer is more than words. It's a spiritual connection where the Holy Spirit intercedes, guiding our clear, concise words to pray in alignment with God's will. When we pray in the Spirit, we're not relying on our own strength, our own thoughts. We're drawing directly to God through His power. And this is something daily. It's something that isn't just a bunch of gibberish with clear, concise words that reach out to the Lord regardless of how we feel. And finally, when the world mocks, we build because love shields us. Love shields us. Keeping yourselves in God's love, verse 21, as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you eternal life. When the world mocks, we build because love shields us. Jude urges believers to actively keep themselves in God's love, as in keep yourselves in the terms and conditions you were taught, that you accept, that, you, that you've submitted to, implying, again, this is a conscious effort. This is not something you're just doing in passing. This is something you must actively do every day. To remain in his love means to stay grounded in his promises, walking with him closely, despite the external opposition of the world. And this is where we become Peter in Matthew 14, where he walks in the water to get closer to Jesus. And we learn from Peter because we know that we cannot let the elements around us take our eyes off of Christ. Again, distractions. Keep yourselves focused on in the state of mind of God's love because God does love you. And he reminds us that our hope lies in the mercy of Jesus Christ, which will ultimately bring us to eternal life. The knowledge of this promised future 
gives us the strength to endure the scorn of the world, knowing that our faith will lead us to a lasting, eternal reward. Love, fortified by prayer and hope, becomes a refuge where we can build and grow. No matter what you're hearing out there, no matter what you're feeling out there, it's going to be there, but you're going to be okay. And if you believe that, and if you know that, share it with somebody. But if you don't, contact us via the information provided earlier in the show. Get-prayer.com, go there, drop us a prayer request, and we will definitely come alongside you in your faith walk. We will build. Until next time, may God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. And God willing, we'll see you next week. You take care. <laughs>